to me, and sometimes it gets the best of me. And this week, my greatest side got the best of me, so the sermon that you're about to hear is told from the perspective of Peter. So, if it sounds a little strange, you look a little perplexed. That's where it, was, that's where it started, and you'll see at the end that it makes sense. So, if you'll take a moment and pray with me. Most merciful and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasable and accepting in your sight, our rock and our reason. Amen. Amen. We had been traveling with Jesus for some time now, and today was no different, really. It was a beautiful journey. See, we were close enough to the Jordan River that things around us were blooming. After all, this is a region known for its fertility and great beauty. It was a nice change of scenery to have luscious plants around us and to see the grove on the slopes of Mount Hermon. I don't know about the other disciples, but this was one of my favorite places to walk with Jesus. A beautiful journey of 25 miles, better than some of the places that Jesus had been taking us that were more on the secluded side. Well, as we left Bethsaida and walked towards Caesarea Philippi, I couldn't help but think about all the things that Jesus had done in the last few weeks. Jesus had been performing miracles. He had been teaching and healing. He was drawing crowds everywhere we went. Not only was Jesus gaining celebrity status, but we, the disciples, were also becoming quite recognizable ourselves. And that was nice if you ask me. I like being known wherever I go. I especially like being known on the days we fed 4,000 people and then a crowd of 5,000. Today was no different. We had a crowd traveling with us. You could hear them talking about Jesus as we walked. And you could hear others talking about how they witnessed him to perform a healing, utterings that Jesus was not happy about. Then there were some who were more focused on the landscape around us and were commenting on the beauty of the earth. And then there were others who were worried about their family they'd left behind. And then there were, of course, people that were talking about what was awaiting us in Caesarea Philippi. And there was others who buzzed about the potential miracles that lie ahead. And then there was Jesus. He was weaving in and out of the people, hearing them speak, but keeping his mouth closed. I knew that couldn't be a good thing. Jesus was thinking about these people and what these people were saying about him. It wouldn't be too long for Jesus to open his mouth. I knew he wasn't happy with the crowd being with us, and it was just a matter of time before all that exhaustion would catch up with him. I was hoping he would actually just take a break. This was a beautiful place after all. It would be a nice place to rest. The other disciples wanted it too. I heard James and John talking of it. And I think Jesus heard them as well. Then Jesus stopped and turned towards his disciples. And all I could think was, here we go again. Jesus asked us, who do people say that I am? Sure enough, he had done it. He put us on the spot. So we told him what we had heard. Some said he was John the Baptist. Others, Elijah. And others would say he was a prophet. Thank God I thought we've dodged a bullet. Now, Jesus can say what he wants to say to the crowd, and we're off the hook. I don't even know why he made us say it. Why didn't he just ask the crowd, there he is. And I was rudely shaken away from my thoughts when Jesus then followed his question with another one. But who do you say that I am? The tension in the air became so thick that none of us could breathe. Who was going to answer this one, I thought. We all had a panicked look on our face, our faces. So like always, Peter the Rock, I put myself out there first and answered, Well, you are the Messiah. Jesus then, Jesus then did his typical thing. Don't talk about it, friends. Keep it to yourself. Jesus sure did have high expectations of us. How are we to keep the good news to ourselves? Shouldn't we be telling the world about the Messiah, about the one who prophets have foretold of, about the one who had saved Israel? 
This is the man who will bring the kingdom of God here on earth. And as I was bubbling in my frustration over keeping silent, Jesus began to say something else. I listened closely as he said, that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed, and after three days would rise again. Okay, if I'm going to be honest, this put me over the edge. Jesus had lost it. This must be the exhaustion talking here. I know Jesus would never say this. And now, he's not only telling us, his disciples, but the crowd has gathered closer around him. Great. There's no PR campaign big enough to fix this. This is not what people should be talking about when we say Messiah. So I did what Jesus needed, in my opinion. I pulled him to the side let my dear friend hear the words of truth sternly. And if you ask the other disciples, they say I was yelling at Jesus. But I promise you it was done in the tone of love for a friend. I didn't want his exhaustion to embarrass him. After all, when you are the Messiah, you can't be talking about being weak or, anyway, I, I guess I'm rambling about my problem with his claim. My exchange with Jesus went something like this. Jesus. What are you thinking? Don't you know what it means to be the Messiah? I know you're tired, but you can't be saying things like this. You know that they're untrue. You know that the Messiah is to be the one that will reign like King David and all the other great kings. Don't you know it means you have great power, wealth, and prestige? Telling people that you are weak, that you don't have the power to overcome the elders, the chief priests, the scribes. If you're going to let them kill you, then you can't be the Messiah. You know the crowds talk. We don't need to deal with this rumor. Besides, you're exhausted. You need to rest before anything else crazy can come out of your mouth. And that's when I noticed Jesus' face changed. And he turned towards the disciples, and they looked back at me, and I could tell I had said something wrong. He was mad, and he yelled back, Get behind you, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on things of the divine, but of human wants. <coughs> Yet again, he humbled me before a crowd. It was humbling, all right, but also very embarrassing. I was trying to deal with him one-on-one, -on -one, but he let everyone around him hear the thing that I did wrong. If that wasn't bad enough, he then tells the eavesdropping crowd to come a little closer. And alongside his disciples, he begins to say, if anyone wants to be my follower, let them deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it for my sake and for the sake of the gospel. For it will profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them, the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes into the glory of his Father and the holy angels. It was dead silent after that, and we began walking again. You could feel the tension in the air. No one was going to speak up or ask questions. It was on that walk, in the midst of tension, that I decided to pick up my cross and follow Jesus. I think the other disciples did too. Although you would have to ask them, since we didn't really talk about it. Since then, I have often thought about what it means to carry the cross. And I try to tell others about it. That's why I'm so glad you're gathered here this morning. I mean, I don't want to have others make the same mistake that I did. But it came to following the Messiah. Or to bear a cross. See, we must understand what it means to bear the cross. And follow him. It's something that I cringed at at first when Jesus told me. And it's something that I see others cringe at to this day because they don't understand what it truly means to bear the cross. See, it's not about making sacrifices that are painful just for the sake of sacrifice or being in pain. It's not about claiming that bad things that have happened to you means that you have to bear your cross. Jesus doesn't expect that. See, that was why he was healing some of these people because many in our community assumed that their physical ailment was bearing a cross, bearing a burden. <clears throat> bearing our cross means that we take, 